declare its independence in an act of defiance against its former colonial master. Ahmed Seko Toure, known as a charismatic and radical figure in Africa's post-colonial history, was the leader of the country at the time and he was the driving force behind this rebellion by the former French colony. However, Guinea and Seko Toure achieved this status of independence against the wishes of its former colonial master, France, and afterwards the nation faced an onslaught of administrative and diplomatic assault by the French which seemed to have been designed to drive the country to its knees. The French colonial elite in Paris got so furious with Seko Toure's defiance such that in an act of fury, the French administration in Guinea destroyed everything in the country that represented what they called the benefits of French colonization. After this whole fiasco, Toure would go on to rule the country of Guinea for 26 years and his time in power and legacy divides opinions. In this episode of African Biographics, we look at the life and legacy of Ahmed Seko Toure, Guinea's first president who stood up to the French and his time in power as the leader of that country. In the early years of the 20th century, the French held most of what would become their colonial territory in West Africa, including present-day Senegal, Mali, Burkina Faso, Benin, Guinea, Ivory Coast, and Niger. But by the close of the Second World War, the colonized people of what was known as French West Africa were making their dissatisfaction with the colonial system heard. French General Charles de Gaulle came to power in France in 1958 and he admitted that the time for colonies had passed and that a substitute system of association was required. This substitute system would come in the form of the proposed French community. Under the appearance of equality, the constitution of the French community restricted the sovereignty of the African states and reaffirmed the preeminence of France. So here is what the administration of Charles de Gaulle was suggesting. They said that any of his territories that wanted independence could take it immediately. Charles de Gaulle promised that France would not oppose it. For those countries that were going to vote for immediate independence, it would be up to France to decide whether to continue to support a newly independent territory depending upon the latter's degree of cooperation. In reality though, Charles de Gaulle wasn't expecting any form of resistance from any of the colonial territories when the time came to vote in referendums for the adoption of the French community. But he had another thing coming and that was in the form of resistance from Guinea led by Ahmed Seko Toure. Affectionately known as the Elephant, Ahmed Seko Toure was born in 1922 in Guinea. At the age of 14, he displayed the spark of political activism as he led a student revolt against a French technical school in Conakry, the capital of Guinea. He was later dismissed from this school. As a young worker in the French colonial administration, he went on to become a trade union activist and this was in 1940. In the following year, in 1941, he took an administrative assignment in the postal service where his interest in the labor movement started increasing. Toure formed close ties with senior labor leaders and organized 76 days of the first successful strike in French-controlled West Africa. Then in 1945, he became the Secretary General of the Post and Telecommunications Workers' Union and participated in the foundation of the Federation of Workers' Union of Guinea, which was linked to the World Federation of Trade Unions. He eventually became the Vice President of the Union. Because of Seko Toure's skills as an orator, he was elected to the French National Assembly in 1951 as the representative of Guinea. From a trade union base, he managed to build up his political party, known as the Parti Democratique de Guinea, the PDG, into a powerful mass movement. In the 1957 elections in Guinea, the PDG won 56 out of a possible 60 seats and Toure, at the age of 35, became Guinea's Prime Minister. Seko Toure was also an admirer of Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah and as such he was far more interested in ideas of pan-African unity than in the French community and he quickly made clear his dislike of de Gaulle's plan of the French community which I alluded to earlier. 
This would explain why he campaigned against the plan and won. When Charles de Gaulle arrived in the capital city of Guinea, Conakry, on 25 August in 1959, at the end of an African tour to campaign for a year's vote for the new French community, he was greeted by crowds lining the streets from the airport shouting independence slogans. Moments later, he was subjected to a brash speech from Ahmed Sekoture attacking France's colonial record and demanding complete decolonization before Guinea joined the Franco-African community, also known as the French community. In the speech, Seko Toure uttered one of his famous statements, which was, and I quote, The notion of a continuing French community would maintain our status of indignity and our status of subordination. We prefer poverty in liberty to riches in slavery. This statement was met with enthusiastic applause by the Guinean crowd present. Angry and slightly embarrassed by what had transpired, Charles de Gaulle rose in reply to defend France's record and he repeated his offer, saying, I say it here even louder than anywhere else, independence is at Guinea's disposal. She can take it by saying no to the proposal which is made to her. And in that case, I guarantee that France will raise no obstacles. But unfortunately for de Gaulle and France, Guinea in the referendum voted no. Guinea's no vote was overwhelming. Over 94% of eligible voters had followed the instruction of their local political leaders over the exhortations of their colonial masters. Guinea proclaimed its independence as a republic four days after the vote to reject the proposed constitution of France's Fifth Republic and with it the offer of membership in the new French community. Not a single other territory in French West Africa or French Equatorial Africa registered a no vote, and in most of the territories, the margin of victory for France was nearly as high as the magnitude of its loss in Guinea. In the anti-colonial world at large, Seko Toure was acclaimed a hero. Unfortunately for him and his country, this decision would have severe economic and political consequences for the newly independent nation. When Seko Toure and Guinea decided in 1956 to get out of the French colonial empire and opted for the country's independence, the French colonial elite in Paris got so angry. Charles de Gaulle's reaction to Guinea's no vote was swift and vindictive. All French aid was terminated. French civil servants and army units, including army doctors largely responsible for providing health services to the civilian population in Guinea, were immediately withdrawn. In a mass exodus, some 3,000 French administrators, teachers, engineers, technicians and businessmen left the country. They took with them any French government property they could carry and in an act of sabotage, destroyed what had to be left behind. Government files and records were burnt. Offices were stripped of furniture and telephones and even their electric light bulbs. And that was not all. Army doctors took away medical supplies and police officers smashed windows in their barracks. When Seko Toure moved into the former governor's house, he found that the furniture and pictures had been removed and the crockery smashed. The purpose of this outrageous act was to send a clear message to all other colonies that the consequences for rejecting France would be very high. But well, Guinea was not done. The country went and ditched the CFA franc currency as the official currency, opting for a national Guinean franc in 1959. In an act of retaliation, the French resorted to counterfeiting the Guinean franc to destabilize the Guinean economy. It is alleged that French special forces printed the counterfeits which were distributed across the country. This whole operation left the Guinean economy in a bad state. The idea was to exert as much pressure as possible on the economy, force it to buckle and depose Seko Toure. Slowly, fear spread through the African elite and none after the Guinea events ever found the courage to follow the example of Seko Toure. Though the other colonies went and got independence in 1960, they were all still loyal to France. 
brutally cut off from French economic support and subsequently refused aid by the United States. Ahmed Sekoture turned for outside aid to replace what France had been providing. Toure turned to his friend and ally Kwame Nkrumah from Ghana. The two leaders shared the ideals of Pan-Africanism, a doctrine that stressed the unity of all African nations above and beyond each nation's own self-interest. Ghana quickly loaned Guinea some $28 million. Seko Toure also turned to the then Soviet Union for assistance. By 1960, nearly half of Guinea's exports were going to the Eastern Bloc nations and the Soviets had committed millions of dollars of aid to the African Republic. As a result of the Soviet influence, Guinea became a socialist country with a command economy, an entrenched communist single-party structure, the PDG, with political cells down to village and district level as well as a system of informants. However, Toure's exclusive association with the communists was short-lived. In 1961, he expelled the Russian ambassador for interfering in the internal affairs of his country, accusing the Soviets of plotting a Marxist revolution. Following this episode, the United States became a significant source of aid for Guinea. In 1963, Toure met with President John F. Kennedy and the United States subsequently loaned Guinea $400 million to develop its bauxite industry. From bauxite is where we derive the metal, aluminium. As time went on, in the 1960s, Toure maintained a stance of positive neutrality with respect to the Cold War conflict between the superpowers, accepting aid from both the United States and the Soviet Union. Following the break from France, Seko Toure imposed a socialist blueprint on Guinea's economy, but at the same time, he inhabited a world of conspiracy. As a result, he began plots and purges, starting in 1960, only two years after Guinea had become independent. He spoke frequently of what he called a permanent plot to overthrow his regime, a vast conspiracy, so he claimed, organized by Western powers and other enemies of the Guinean revolution. Some plots were undoubtedly real, some were deliberately created, but unfortunately, others were simply fictitious. For instance, in 1961, he announced the discovery of a teacher's plot after teachers had demanded equal pay for equal work and criticized government policies. Prominent teachers and intellectuals were detained, and the Soviet ambassador was summarily expelled, accused of meddling in Guinea's affairs and sponsoring this revolt. About one-fifth of Guinea's population immigrated to neighboring African countries, mostly to escape his harsh domestic policies. His regime became notorious for short trials, public executions, arbitrary imprisonment, and the use of torture. In 1965, after a group of traders tried to form an opposition party and nominated a candidate to stand in the presidential election against Seko Toure, they were arrested and condemned to death. In 1972, a shortage of medicine was described by Seko Toure as a plot by the physicians to discredit the revolution. He also interpreted news of a cholera epidemic in Guinea in 1973 as a counter-revolutionary plot. This constant barrage of permanent plots by the Seko Toure regime instilled fear amongst the citizens and coerced them to comply with the government. But earlier on, I also said that some of the plots against Seko Toure were real, and this led to him having an increase in paranoia. For instance, in June of 1970, Radio Conakry reported on an impending invasion of Guinea by forces that were being trained in Portuguese Guinea, now known as Guinea-Bissau. A few months later, a group of mercenaries were arrested in the country. Toure had given support to the long anti-colonial struggle that was being waged in Guinea-Bissau. For generations, the Portuguese government had held the tiny African province in its grip. So Seko Toure provided freedom fighters in Guinea-Bissau with base facilities and diplomatic support. Portugal countered by conducting a major propaganda campaign against Seko Toure, characterizing his regime 
as a Marxist dictatorship. And in 1970, the Portuguese helped mount a mercenary invasion of Guinea. This invasion led Seko Ture to believe that the conspiracy against his government was universal. As destructive as the mercenary plot was, the invasion failed to unseat Seko Ture. Instead, it led to a reign of terror, suspicion and violence in Guinea. Public figures suspected of holding opinions critical to Ture and his government were classified as subversives and were arrested. Secret mass trials and executions followed. The bodies of the condemned were later displayed in public places. The nation of Guinea was potentially a rich country with well-watered coastal plains and the extensive uplands offering huge agricultural potentials and vast deposits of bauxite and iron ore. But Turia's economic strategy proved very destructive. To free Guinea from its subordination to France and to prevent the rise of an elite entrepreneurial class in the country, he extended state control to every sector of the economy. Independent traders were denounced as bourgeoisie traitors to the revolution and were replaced by a huge state trading corporation. The result was a string of state corporations that were badly managed, heavily in debt, rife with corruption and crippled by low production. Sekoture's policies and other grievances over the shortage of goods and rough treatment dealt by his regime led to protest demonstrations by market women which began in rural centers, then spread to provincial towns and finally erupted in the capital. When market women in Conakry marched on the presidential palace, government troops were instructed to fire on them. What saved Guinea from complete ruin was the revenue derived from the country's bauxite mines, which Ture was careful to leave in the hands of the foreign companies. By the late 1970s and early 80s, after 20 years of enforced socialism, Ture began to retreat, permitting some private business and trading firms to operate and disbanding his economic police. He also began reaching out to Western investors. He would later explain that, quote, for the first 20 years, we have concentrated on developing the mentality of our people. Now we are ready to do business with others. By 1976, diplomatic relations were re-established between Guinea and France. French business people were allowed to pursue trade and investment opportunities in Guinea. Guinea compensated nationalized French companies while the French agreed to pay the pensions of 20,000 Guinean ex-servicemen. Guinea also released Europeans imprisoned in Conakry for allegedly plotting to overthrow the government. In 1982, he traveled to New York to appeal to Wall Street financiers for increased private investment in Guinea. Ahmed Sekoture died in 1984 while undergoing a heart operation in an American hospital. By the time of his death, he had ruled the country of Guinea for 26 years. In April of 1984, the army staged a coup and took over the country, filling the political void that had been left by the death of Seko Ture. Despite his controversial domestic policies, Ahmed Seko Ture is also remembered as a strong champion of African unity and pan-Africanism who wasted no time in attempting to strengthen ties with neighboring and other African countries and thus lessen their collective dependence on former European colonizers. Others also see him as a dictator. Let me know in the comment section below what your opinion is on the life and legacy of Ahmed Sekoture. Don't forget to like and share the video if you enjoyed it. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been Tatenda for African Biographics. Until next time, cheers. Have a good one.